Okay, well, um, great. Thank you for having me. And um, Mary thought this might be of interest to the group, even though it's, um, I won't be talking about oaks at all. So, um, but um, we can ho hopefully that um, you'll still um, can find some information to take away from um, some of this, this research. So um, um, if I could just add to that, Sharon, sure. What I found really fascinating was just that there is the ecological story about fire is so much more complex than just it removed fuels, it killed trees, it didn't kill trees, you know, just that there's a whole bunch of other creatures in the forest that uh, may have had a positive uh, response uh, from low intensity fires. So it, it's a, I think it's just the ecological story that you're, you're learning about that I find really fascinating. So thank you for being here. Okay. Yeah, no, that's great. We're finding um, out ways, new things all the time about how fire affects um, different components of the um, ecosystem. So that's definitely part of this research here. Um, so I'll just kind of jump in with, I probably don't need to tell this group um, with this, especially how big of a disturbance wildfire is, especially in the Western US. Um, this is a map showing um, frequency of, of fire um, from um, about the 80s to early 2000s. And, but uh, another huge disturbance in Western US are from bark beetles. And these are native bark beetles that can outbreak during um, when conditions are right and um, also cause um, a lot of mortality in our Western conifer forests. So um, this map on the left is showing um, bark beetle cause mortality about that same time frame as um, the 80s to 2000s um, as the, the wildfire map. And what I'm trying to um, show here is just that the how large these two disturbances um, are and across our Western landscapes, but also um, how they impact many of the same areas. So there's lots of opportunities for these disturbances to interact and um, change how the following um, following disturbances, the impact of following disturbances. Um, Andrew set me up um, very well for for this talk talking about the um, about tree rings and altered fire regimes. Um, so in our Ponderosa pine forest that I'm mostly going to be focused on focusing on in this talk, um, Historically, these would have burned, uh, these forests would have burned very frequently with low intensity. So a lot of um, like the picture on the left, where um, those uh, small trees might have been killed, but the overstory trees um, largely survived. Um, and the, um, for due to fire suppression and several other factors, we're seeing that, that densification of these forests. Um, like Andrew showed, and um, to where now when these ponderosa pine forests burn, they can often support much higher intensity wildfire like you see on the right. Um, bark beetle outbreaks are also changing. Even though these are native beetles, we um, know that they are um, lasting, uh, the individual outbreaks are lasting a longer um, period of time. Then historically, they're moving um, further north um, and farther parts of Canada and also at um, um, higher elevation forests too. So with we're seeing changes in disturbance regimes from both fire and bark beetles. So a big part of my research is thinking about how a change in the fire regimes will affect bark beetles. We know that fire and bark beetles have direct influence, and that's what I'm trying to show with these solid arrows um, on our on forest uh, structure and composition, but we also know that they can have these indirect effects. Um, and so uh, this research really got started from other another um, part of my um, uh, research that I do uh, looking at post-fire tree mortality. So um, I'm here, I'm showing a pattern from one study site um, where we were tracking trees that were killed, or 
tracking um, mortality over time after this 2003 wildfire. And we are also tracking when um, and which trees were attacked by bark beetles. And so this is just one study site, but I was seeing the same pattern um, over many areas where um, on the x-axis here is the proportion of all the trees, of, of all the attacks that occurred over a, a three-year time frame. And almost all the attacks occurred the year after this fire. Um, and so this uh, seeing this pattern across numerous sites was um, really um, causing me to wonder what was going on because it wasn't from lack of host, green host trees. There's still plenty of living ponderosa pine of um, as big enough to be attacked by mountain pine beetle in this case. Um, and they just weren't being attacked. And it also wasn't from a lack of bark beetle pressure. So this map inset in the red is showing mountain pine beetle activity um, and mountain pine beetle cause mortality in Western Montana at about the same time frame. So um, when this wildfire occurred, it was in the midst of a, a, a large regional mountain pine beetle outbreak. So there's plenty of beetles flying around, but they uh, we weren't observing them attacking and killing the um, trees in the um, after that first year of fire. And uh, so this really led me to dig into the literature and try to figure out some um, things that was going on. It eventually led to me going back and get my PhD um, a, a, focusing on this research. And so um, one study really struck me in particular um, on the um, about acacia trees and herbivory. So these are trees that you can see here have really large um, thorns. Um, they're kind of covering the trees and those thorns are a deter deterrent to, for um, against giraffes and elephants and researchers had constructed exclusions around structures around these trees to see what would happen when um, the trees weren't exposed to this regular um, er herbivory. And what they found was pretty immediately within a couple years, the trees were um, started um, producing fewer and shorter thorns. So there, um, so this was really intriguing to me how, you know, we think of plants as kind of static and um, and just kind of being subjected to their environment. Um, but it exposed me to a whole area of literature just about how um, responsive plants are um, to their environment and how much they can change. So in this case, thorns are really expensive. And so if they don't, if a plant doesn't have to produce them uh, because it's not being eaten, um, then it, it's, it reduces the, uh, um, the amount of resources it puts into those defenses. So um, switching back to pines, um, their pines also have a lot of defenses um, to bark beetles. Um, and these, and so I wondered if how fire fit into the story. We know that um, uh, bark beetle attacks do often increase that first year after the fire. Um, so, but but then again, we weren't seeing this um, sustained increase. So I started to wonder about how, you know, if if fire as a reg, you know, routine, historically regularly burned through these forests by removing fire, could we be changing how um, trees, um, could we be changing tree defenses and how trees allocate defenses to beetles? So, um, a little bit of background about tree defenses, just to um, be before I dive into the the study, um, and also one we know that um, resin flow increases after fire. This has been documented um, across pines across the world, um, and uh, it was um, and so I, I we knew that, but we really weren't sure um, what else was going on or um, and how that played into the actual resistance to beetles. So, um, so pines have, have resin ducts, lots of um, 
tree species will have these resin ducts, but they're most comp they're most um, complex in pine species. And so this is just showing a cross section of wood here, and these ducts are um, they're horizontal in in the tree, so they span across these uh, tree rings, like that Andrew talked about. Like these are individual tree rings, and they also um, are vertically throughout the um, the xylem of the tree. So that's what's being shown oh, um, here. And so this these resin ducts form this interconnected network. Um, throughout pines. This is a, um, this picture here is showing a cross section of um, a pine tree. I've outlined some of the resin ducts here in um, black. This is just one of the, the pencil markings showing um, with related to cross dating that Andrew described. Um, so you can, it, and really nice thing about resin ducts is just like tree rings that can give us a, um, and fire scars that can give us an um, insight about um, what these trees have been exposed to over their lifetime. Resin ducts are also embedded in the wood structure so we can go back in time and see how resin ducts have changed and relate that to both fire and climate. Um, another important thing about resin ducts here is um, on this bottom section is showing a stained image of the, the red as uh, the, um, the tracheids and the, the wood of the um, tree and the xylem. These blue stained cells are the um, epithelial cells around a resin duct. So these um, blue cells are where um, resin is actually made and it's stored in these um, inside the, the resin duct and then can be um, these vertical resin ducts and then transported horizontally uh, um, uh, to the wounding site. So resin ducts act as um, good defense because it's the site of they're where resin is made, it's, um, it's where resin is stored and it's how resin is transported throughout the tree. Um, and we know that more resin ducts equal more resin flow. So the resin flow itself, this resin is actually um, the main and the, the, the direct defense against bark beetles. So you can see this tree, the, as beetles bore into the tree, it severs these um, resin ducts and this um, resin starts to ooze out and that acts as a physical uh, deterrent to kind of can trap the beetles, but it also is a chemical defense and that it's a um, has a very complex mixture of different compounds and some of those compounds are toxic to um, bark beetle metabolism. So what we've shown here is um, on the x-axis as uh, is total duct area, um, which is these are all little resin ducts with, um, within one um, ring. And so as the total uh, as total duct area increases, that um, resin flow increases. Um, so that's important because when we measure those studies that have shown measured resin flow um, increasing after fire, it's those are real really snapshots in time. So resin flow can change with um, throughout the season and based on temperature and a variety of things. But if um, this we if we can measure resin ducts as a surrogate for um, defense, it allows us to go again much deeper in time, and it also and it's a much more repeatable measure than um, just resin itself. So um, we did a study look at, looking at if low severity fire increases resin ducts. So these were areas we we went into where we cored trees that had survived the fire. So they, they had been burned, um, but they, again, like Andrew was talking about, they had um, they had a low, low enough levels of injury to where they were able to continue to grow. And we cored those trees inside of um, burned areas and outside of the burned areas about eight years after the fire um, to see how um, resin ducts compared before and after the fire, both in our burned and unburned trees. Uh, so this uh, first slide here is showing on the x-axis, it's showing the year before fire and the year after fire on two sites. Um, and in these, it, here I'm plotting the unburned trees. So even though it's saying 
before and after fire, these are kind of what you can think of as our control trees. So what's going on just with, with resin duct area in the absence of fire. But again, this same wood years, the calendar years. Um, so make sure we're comparing um, the, 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 same, um, the same tree rings um, in the burned trees and the, and the unburned trees. Okay, so you, we don't really see, we don't see a difference or slight variation. It's not statistically different, so, um, but not a real big difference um, in uh, the unburned trees before and after the fire. But in our burned trees, we see a um, significant increase in the uh, duct area the year after the fire on both of the sites. So this was sh showing that yeah, fire does stimulate resin duct production, um, and that's likely what's causing that increase in resin flow that had already been documented. Um, this led me to ask, so what does this mean for areas where we've had um, um, seen fire exclusion, like so many of our pine forest, ponderosa pine forest in, in the Western US? Um, I was fortunate to be able to use um, the um, samples collected for um, over three fire history studies um, by Eric Keeling and Emily Heyerdahl. Where so we um, so I was had access to tree cores where we knew the fire history. Um, these were areas that um, prior to European settlement had burned approximately every three to twenty years. So very frequent, low intensity fire regime. Um, and um, but the the last fire at these um, at two of the sites had been about eighty years ago. Um, but in one site was in the middle of uh, the Frank Church uh, River of No Return Wilderness, a very large wilderness area in Idaho, where fire had not been excluded in the 1900s. So I was able to compare resin ducts over a 75-year chronology before and after the era of fire suppression to see um, if we see a, a, a decline in resin ducts um, after fire exclusion. Um, so here I'm showing on, on the left, the site in Idaho, again, these um, where fires have continued, that's in the wilderness area. Um, and it's, again, before and after um, the, what we call calling here the fire cessation period, so which we know the last fire was 1925. So these, this is the average duct area for the 75 years bef before 1925 and after 1925. And in the areas where fires had continued in the 1900s, um, we don't see a decline in resin ducts in, in the, the tree ring record. Um, but in the areas where fires had stopped after 1925, um, there was this decline um, compared to um, the, the era when fires were burning frequently through these forests. Um, we found the same pattern at a, the site in Oregon, where here the last fire was 1870, and um, but we so we see a, a, um, also a, a decline in resin duct area once fires stop um, uh, um, burning routinely through these forests. So this has kind of big implications for thinking about. You know, not only is um, by removing frequent fire, we changing forest structure and composition, but uh, we are also physiologically changing um, how trees allocate um, resources to growth, reproduction, and defenses. Um, and so I was finally able to um, kind of look at this in more of an experimental setting where um, I was already involved in this uh, a study of the, it was called the fire and fire surrogate study, um, where there are um, four treatments of a control. Um, there's a prescribed burn only um, and a thinning, um, and then a thinning uh, followed by a prescribed burn. Uh, the site I was um, studying is at Lubrecht Experimental Forest in Western Montana. These sites were thinned in 2001 and burned in 2002. And the original purpose of uh, this study is was to look at how to, um, what kinds of treatments can be used to reduce fire hazard in, in 
um, in Ponderosa Pine Forest, but also with the restoration angle of how do we, how do we, can we use fire or do, can, do we, can we just do it through um, cutting alone to, to restore um, these fire dependent forests. Um, unplanned at the time of the study was this um, mountain pine beetle outbreak that began in about, uh, really affecting the area in about 2005. So um, there's a, a map of the area. Um, this is the dot is Missoula and stars the capital and Helena. And these um, insets show the three um, three blocks, the 12 um, uh, units uh, in the study. Um, and that red is um, from aerial detection surveys that uh, the Forest Service uh, does to um, document bark beetle outbreak, uh, bark beetle activity. And so what um, was rather unique about this study is that um, all these blocks were challenged by bark beetles. So it can be very difficult to know if our treatments are actually effective against bark beetle outbreaks if they're not, if bark beetle, uh, bark beetle outbreak doesn't occur and, and actually test that. It, um, we don't really, we know. So here we could look directly at the effects of the, the treatments, you know, the effects the treatments were having on um, bark beetle activity within those treatments. Um, and what we found um, is that the treatments had a, a huge impact on um, the severity of the bark beetle outbreak. So I have the, the four treatments here on the x-axis and the percentage of ponderosa pine um, that's a host size. Um, so here, these are about, uh, these are the six inches and greater um, diameter trees that were killed by mountain pine, pine beetle um, during the outbreak. Um, and so the median is shown here in the dark um, uh, black bars. Um, you can see there's a, a large amount of variation, um, which is um, what uh, is what typical during outbreaks. There, it's not um, very uniform. They might attack in clusters, but overall, the um, the control caused of, uh, the, in the control about fifty percent of the pines were killed during the outbreak. Um, it was about eighteen percent in the um, burn only. And the median was zero in the thin and thin and burn. So the the treatments that involved thinning um, had uh, were very effective at um, reducing mortality from the outbreak. So why is that? Um, some of what we we think we we so we cored these trees um, in two thousand and twelve, um, and these are. So here's time on the, the x-axis and the arrows show the dates of the thinning and burning. And here I'm showing basal area increment. So that's that the amount of wood that's produced um, annually uh, uh, um, in, in the tree ring. Um, so the, um, or, and so it's not a big surprise when you thin a forest and reduce that density there's more resources to grow. And that's exactly what we see. These trees um, in the thin and thin and burn units immediately start growing faster relative to the control and burn only. Um, and I should point out that these, the, these sites were areas where there had been fire suppression. Um, so it had been you know, 80, at least 80 plus years since the last fire. So it, it's kind of um, not, it wasn't really a fees, it's not realistic to expect one prescribed burn to really restore the structure of these forests, whereas thinning followed by um, burning can do that much um, more quickly. Um, we also looked at resin ducts. So now I'm showing the total duct area on the x-axis, I mean the y-axis, and you can see that the um, the amount of duct area really tracks that basal area increment. So faster growing trees are also producing more resin ducts. Um, we found a slight bump in um, resin ducts in the, in the thin and burn and also the, um, the burn only, but it was really small um, compared to that magnitude that we saw um, from looking at uh, 
spores collected from wildfires. Um, so we're still trying to um, tease out that effect um, of you know, how much prescribed burning can increase um, resin ducts relative to wildfires. Um, and so we also um, looked at that resin composition. So again, this, this resin here is this mix of um, many, many monoterpenes um, and, and other, um, other terpenes as well. But monoterpenes form the bulk of the, um, the, the, um, of the, the resin. And so this is showing total um, monoterpenes across the four treatments, again, in the same order as the previous graphs. And so we, the burn only reduced the monoterpenes, um, but uh, looking at um, individual monoterpenes that we know um, have, where we know the biological um, effect of those um, terpenes had some, um, showed um, some interesting results. Again, this is about 12 years after the treatment. So these are sustained differences. Um, so we see a, a, the in the burn only treatment, there was a, um, a decrease in alpha pine, pinene, myrcene, and delta-3 carine. And these are all uh, monoterpenes that the mountain pine beetle actually uses to their benefit to help um, bring it to add, um, produce an aggregation pheromone and help bring other beetles into the tree um, as it's being attacked. Um, and these compounds also increase, um, they, they basically just help um, in the beetles communicate better um, to uh, and when they are um, trying to aggregate and mass attack a, a tree. Um, so that so that's actually it's beneficial to a tree to have less of these three compounds. Um, in the control treatment, the um, it had the lowest amount of limonene, and limonene is the most toxic um, compound to the beetles. So um, a tree with less limonene is thought to have or to be more susceptible to attacks. So um, it was interesting, even though the overall monoterpene um, didn't really seem to um, shed much light about how thinning and burning changed resin defenses, those individual um, compounds um, seem to um, tell a, a, a much or explain some of the patterns we were seeing. So again, just um, this. Um, that these the thinning and thinning were burning again were produced this pretty remarkable effect of these are about 30 acre uh, treatment units, but they were still able to be very effective at um, against uh, the outbreak and we, we saw very little mortality. So what that means um, kind of for the, the future of these um, these units at, um, is, that we saw this the this outbreak uh, caused a pretty big shift in species dominance. So um, these bars again, they're set up same order of um, the treatments, and they're showing the ratio of ponderosa pine to Douglas fir before the outbreak. So this is a few years after the treatment, but in 2005, um, right before the outbreak begins. And so anything above this one line are is ponderosa pine dominated for us. So as we would expect, because the thin and thin and burn um, intentionally removed most of the Douglas fir, those treatments were heavily dominated by um, ponderosa pine. Um, whereas the control and burn only there without um, with decades and decades of fire exclusion, there had been a, a lot of Douglas fir established, and you know we see a, a lower ratio, still dominated by ponderosa pine, but much less so than the thin and thin and burn treatments. Um, after the outbreak, we see this um, shift because of the mortality that the um, from the beetles in the control units. There's now more Douglas fir than ponderosa pine. Um, and the burn only, it's getting a, you know, very, it's, there's, it's about the same, you know, equal um, amounts, just a little bit more ponderosa pine 
um, compared to Douglas fir. So in the absence of future disturbances, we would expect these treatments to continue to become more and more dominated by Douglas fir and transition away from being uh, ponderosa pine forest. Um, and then we see the, the thin only and thin and burn are still very much dominated by ponderosa pine. Um, there had this, this is showing all sizes of trees. So these, you know, there is some decline over time as Douglas fir gets established and seedlings begin, um, they tend to grow in these treatments. Uh, so here's a snapshot of what these um, treatments are looking like about 15 years post treatment. Um, on the left in the control, you see a lot of those um, uh, dead um, trees that were killed by the mountain pine beetle. Um, and a lot of them have come down. Most of these trees, this was taken about five years ago, they um, have since now come down. A lot of fuel loading um, um, in, in these areas. Um, a similar pattern in the burn only, just not as severe as the control. The big difference that um, doesn't really come out in the data I presented between the thin only and thin and burn is that, you know, the 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 prescribed burn killed a lot of those small um, Douglas fir seedlings that um, that have since grown up in the thin only where it, where there wasn't a burn. So these these thin only and thin and burn units looked very similar um, right after the treatment, but um, because of the burn, um, the treatments are in the tre the thin and burn treatment is lasting much longer as a as a um, as a fuel treatment and a way to reduce fire hazard relative to the the thin only where this is good. If there's a lot of ladder fuels. Um, establishing and it's going to need um, more frequent maintenance compared to um, any treatments that have a, um, a prescribed burn to them. So um, just in conclusion, um, these forests that are maintained by frequent and low severity fire or that um, have fuel treatments that use thinning and fire, we um, know can increase resistance to wildfire, but also increase resistance to bark beetles. Uh, and that's really due to um, the fire stimulating uh, tree defenses and also changing the forest structure. So it helps to buffer against those mountain pine beetle outbreaks. Um, and by adding um, the a burning treatment, your effective, uh, those treatments become effective much longer at reducing um, potential fire behavior. Um, so that's all I have. Thanks for listening and happy to answer any questions.